Time to get started now. And I want to welcome all of you that joined us online also. Thank you for being with us tonight. And our first song tonight will be page 186, and I'll have you stand, if you would, please. <coughs> page 186. All together. Take time to be holy. Speak off with thy Lord. Abide in him always. And feed on his word. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak. Good to be here with y'all this week. We sure appreciate the Lord's help. 
And God speak in the hearts. I'm glad we have a faithful God, aren't you? Yes. One who's never leave us nor forsake us. I've always loved the words of this song you listen to. It's called Patching It Up. It seems that every time I need Him, my Lord is always there. But no one else seems to have the time. Jesus always cares. I wonder just what I I call his name one day, and the heavens above just opened up, and I heard my Savior say, I'm through patching it up. I thank my God in heaven each night. My Lord is not that way. I know He's watching over me each and every single day. And I don't have to wonder about His love. She flows so free, and I know just exactly what my father will say when I'm down on my knees. I'll always patch things up. I'll always give. Tonight, and those who are joining us online, we're glad to have you uh, with us. Uh, the prayer list is going around on the clipboards. If you have any prayer requests or praises, do take a moment and write them down. We'll do our best to try to get those copied off of the evening. You can take them with you tonight. Just a, a few announcements to um, to be aware of. And in prayer for the offering boxes on the back table again tonight. So anything that we collect this week, we're giving directly to Brandon or his family. So if you uh, want to put any money in there or, or any or a check, you can write directly to Brandon Smith. We'll make sure we give him, uh, make sure we get that, that all to them before they leave town. 
uh, this evening. Also, at the end of the service tonight, uh, this is our Youth Emphasis Night, so I want to thank all the kids for coming out tonight and being here. Um, but at the end, when we give the altar call and invitation, I'm going to ask all the Awanas workers, the class workers, or any adults who want to come forward just to be up here at the altar. So if the kids do want to come forward and have somebody to pray with, we're ready to receive them at the end of the service. We can be praying uh, about that. Um, one more thing, on Monday night, uh, there had a couple people that had asked uh, how they can get involved, um, the ways that they could serve. Some of the most immediate needs we have right now are in the nursery and in our children's classes right now. So if anybody wants to jump in and help out in the nursery, that's a, a need we've, we've had kind of in the bulletin for the past eight to ten months. Um, so anybody that can, that can help out in there would definitely be uh, a big help. Anybody wants to help out in any of the, kill, in any of the kids' ministries, let me know, because a lot of the workers we do have in children's ministries are doing double or triple duty because they do uh, a lot of the kids' ministry. So anybody wants to help out in those, there's a lot of other areas to help out in too, but two, those are two of the most immediate needs that come to mind. So pray over that, and if, uh, after the service tonight, if, if the Lord's been speaking your heart about getting involved in a certain area of ministry, uh, please let me know. And we're going to, I'm going to, uh, have a, we're going to pray, I'm going to have Brother Bud come lead us in one more song, and after that, Brandon, you come right up after the end of the, the congregational song and uh, uh, take lead in this service and close it out as as the Lord leads you. Lord, we just thank you so much for the song that Brendan just sang. Father, we thank you that we don't have to earn your love. Yes. We don't have to uh, work to receive your mercy. And Father, I just pray that you will uh, help us not take that for granted, Father. Help us to not um, use that as a reason to, to not get involved, to not serve you the way we ought to. And Father, we just thank you for the messages Brandon's brought to us the past a uh, few days, I pray you'll be with him in a special way tonight. I pray you'll be with the message, uh, be with a messenger. I just pray that you'll prepare our hearts to receive everything you want us to tonight. We pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 song we're going to sing is an old familiar song and sometimes you get a little so you know them pretty well I can remember I was out at the, uh, the infirmary one one year singing this song and I looked down and the words in their book were <laughs> not the words that I was singing so sometimes you need to pay attention to the book and not what you remember <laughs> uh, the last song we'll sing so will be page 118 Rock of Ages and I'll have you stand if you would please page 118 together. Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath tears forever flow, could my zeal no longer know, these for sin could not atone, thou must save and thou alone, in my hand no price I bring, simply to Prayer requests tonight. If you keep these 
uh, in prayer. Please pray for Miss Janet. She's been up at the hospital today with her son, Scott. He was on the prayer list about a month ago. Um, he's back in the hospital today. His heart is only functioning at about 10% capacity. So pray for Scott and be with Miss Janet. That's why she's not here to play the piano with us. She's up in uh, Arnett with her son in Elmira. So please pray for her son, Scott, for physical needs. And also do pray for Brandon's church, for Union Baptist Church down in Summertown, Tennessee. We've been blessed to have him with us this week. Um, and I know uh, he has a pastor's heart. He's got a heart for his people. Um, and they have services tonight while he's here ministering to us. So let's pray for uh, the word as he goes forth down in Tennessee tonight. That God will bless that church for allowing Brandon the liberty to come up and be with us this week. It's certainly been a blessing to us to have you with us. And I'm excited to see how God works with you tonight. So I'm going to ask Brandon to come forward now and, and take the service. serve a mighty God this evening. Amen. Thank you for that mention tonight. I do appreciate the prayers. I got a phone call this morning, or a voicemail rather. Uh, the guy that was going to fill in for me tonight has gotten sick, and so we had to cancel our services back in uh, the summertime there at the church that I pastor. And uh, so, but we still would covet your prayers this evening. We ask that you would just remember us as we try to be a beacon and a lighthouse there in that community. And uh, God has sure blessed our church over these years. And we pray that He'll continue to do so. People say, does your church have problems? Every church has problems, right? Uh, I, I know that to be the case. No matter where we go, there is no perfect church. And if you find one, don't join it. You'll mess it up, right? Amen. Right. Uh, but I do appreciate it. It's good to see all the young people in the house this evening. Got a few notes handed to me a while ago, and I appreciate the heart behind those notes. And we're thankful that you're in the house of the Lord this evening. This is Youth Emphasis Night. Uh, but I love the truth and the beautiful thing of God's Word this evening, that while the message is directed towards the youth and the young people and the generation that's coming up, it's good for every one of us tonight. Amen? It's good for every one of us this evening. I'd have you, if you would, join me standing and find your place in God's Word in 1 Samuel chapter number 17 tonight. 1 Samuel chapter number 17. I am not going to read all of these verses. Uh, we're not going to try to cover. In fact, I know this tonight. There's no way we can encompass all of these verses tonight. I'm going to do the best that I can to try to keep this train of thought that we're going to introduce here momentarily, uh, but I'm going to kind of hit the highlights of the text this evening. And so for time's sake, uh, for introductory reading, our introductory reading tonight, uh, we will begin our reading in verse number uh, 49. So take your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter number 17, and let's look together at verse number 49. If you found your place tonight, would you say amen? amen? Amen. It is good to see you again. Thank you for being in God's house. Let me say this. Thank you to those who made an effort to be here every single night this week. Yes. And the Lord will bless your faithfulness. That does. That is indicative tonight of a heart that wants something from God. And I appreciate you sacrificing. I know it's not easy, especially when you get to this point of the week. It's been a long week. It's been tiresome. I, I know this, God rewards and will bless your faithfulness. And I appreciate you being here each and every night this week. Let's look together at verse number 49, 1 Samuel chapter number 17. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. But we pray together this evening in the house of the Lord, ask God's blessing 
on the reading and the preaching of his word. Uncle Rich, if you will, would you pray for us? be seated this evening. Thank you for standing in reverence to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, infallible Word. Amen. I can empathize with what Brother Bug was talking about, the hymns, just a moment or two ago. Sometimes the hymns are so familiar to us, we have learned the verses to them. I have that issue at our church there. We have a different hymn book than what I was ever used to before coming there. And I have a habit sometimes of trying to think about the words of the song that I'm singing. And I'll close my eyes because I've been singing these songs for 40 years, praise God, and I know the words. And I'll look up sometimes and I'll sing a word of some, uh, phrase or a stanza uh, that I sang sitting in this auditorium as a kid growing up, and I'm looking up and the audience lost his last year's Easter egg. <laughs> because I've sang something different than what is in front of them. I believe the same rings true for the Scriptures tonight. I think there are stories in the Word of God that are so familiar to us that when we hear a preacher or a Sunday school teacher or some uh, Bible teacher ask us to turn to this place, it's like, oh, here we go again. We're going to talk about Moses. Or, oh, here we go again, we're talking about the Ten Commandments. Or, here we go again, we're talking about Rahab. And maybe some of you tonight said, oh, here we go again, we're talking about David and Goliath. <laughs> familiarity, somebody said, breeds contempt. But I believe when it comes to the Word of God, familiarity ought to help us this evening. Yeah. It does not hurt anybody in here this evening to hear these stories over and over and over again. In fact, it ought to prepare you to be able to teach somebody else about it. Amen? Uh, I want to preach to you for a few moments. We'll jump right into this tonight. Here's the thought of the message tonight. How to be a difference maker. David made a difference in the text, did he not? David's willingness to do what nobody else will do at a time when nobody else will do it proved to be the difference in this text. And it did not just change that day. It did not just change that hour. It did not just change that week. But it changed the course and the direction of the nation of Israel from that moment forward. Young people, could I say to you this evening and older folks alike, we need some difference-making Christians in our world today. We have too much ho-hum Christianity. We have too much I don't care Christianity in the world today. We have too much lazy Christianity and lackadaisical Christianity, apathetic Christianity. Doesn't make a difference to me Christianity. We don't need any more of that. We've got pews full of people all around this country and all around this world that are that way when it comes to the things of God. What we need is some difference-making Christians. Now you listen, young people, the world will tell you you can't make a difference. You'll find in our text tonight, somebody approached David asked him what in the world he thought he was even doing in that place. In other words, you can't make a difference with what's going on. What good are you? But I'm telling you, you can do a work for God. You can do a work for the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't make a difference. One person totally sold out. I believe it was Spurgeon that said this. The world has yet to see what God can do with one person who is completely and totally sold out to Him. I want us to look at this text very briefly tonight. I don't plan on keeping you long. I like what one preacher said, I'll tell you like Elizabeth Taylor told her last five husbands, I won't keep you long. Amen. <laughs> How are you going to be a difference maker? The young people are like, who's Elizabeth Taylor? <laughs> She had a lot of experience in getting married, all right? Yeah. How can you be a difference maker? I believe our text gives us an outline on how we can make a difference. And you might be here tonight and you might say, well, I'm not a youth. I'm not in my uh, age of youth. It doesn't matter. It's never too late to get started serving God. Right. 
You can be a difference maker. No matter what age you are tonight, young or old, you can make a difference for the cause of Christ. Let's talk about this for a few moments. Number one, I believe the first way that we see, let's look at verses 20 and 22 tonight of 1 Samuel chapter number 17. I believe the first way that you can be a difference maker is to be careful with your charge. David was careful with his charge. Now I have to give you a little bit of setup for this. By the time we get to verse number 20, uh, David has been out in the field and he's been watching the sheep. And that was David's occupation. He was a shepherd. And he had been out there in the field watching sheep for his father, shepherding the flock that was out there. But his father has given him a mission. David, in verse number 20, has become a man on a mission. He's been told to take some supplies, some cheeses there to his brethren, and his dad tells him, go down there to the battle and see how thy brethren fare. In other words, see how they are doing. Check in on them. See what they are as it comes to their welfare and their well-being. And there's where we pick up the narrative in verse number 20. Watch your Bibles. And David rose up early in the morning and left his sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. What we find is taking place here is that the Philistine army and the Israelite army are on separate sides there of the Valley of Elah. And it's basically like an old school, uh, high school fight, if you will, where a bunch of people's talking and nobody's throwing any punches. Can I get a witness tonight? <laughs> I like what one, one person said, I'm not for fighting, but if you're, if you're bound and determined to fight out in the parking lot after church, let me know. I want to watch. <laughs> I, I'm not for that. No, I, that was a terrible thing to say to you. All right? Don't be fighting outside. But here it is, the battle's ensuing. But nobody is advancing. I believe the evidence shows that both sides are scared to death. The Philistine army thinks they've got an advantage. I've had the privilege of standing there in the Valley of Elon. It's very easy to see, given the landscape, how that one army can be heard by the other army as they're standing on the separate mountains of the side, or the, the separate mountain sides there in the Valley of Elon. And so there they are shouting back and forth. David's been commanded by his father to go check on his brethren and David gets there. And I'll note, notice what David does in verse number 20 before he ever leaves. The Bible said that he left his sheep in the hands of a keeper. Yep. Amen. He was, not, uh, he was not irresponsible when it came to his occupation. He made sure that his duties and his responsibilities at the house were taken care of before he ever left. And then when he gets to the battle... As he goes in to see his brethren, he does not just leave the carriage unattended, but the Bible says that he leaves his carriage in the hand of the keeper. He say, Preacher, what are you trying to say? I've gone a long way around the mulberry bush to tell you this this evening. That if we're going to make a difference, we're going to have to start with taking care of what God has already given us. You say, God hasn't given me much. Last time I checked, everybody in here seems well fed this evening. Amen. Amen. You got a place to put your head down this evening. You have a family that God has given you, no matter what that looks like, no matter what the uh, demographic is, God has blessed you in ways that you cannot imagine. We ought to take care of what God has already given us. Now, if we're not taking care of what God's already given us, you answer me this tonight. Why should God give you more? That's right. If you're irresponsible with what God has already given you, why in the world do you think that God should give you more. I don't know about you, but I get so sick of this entitlement society tonight. That just because I exist and just because I breathe, I deserve X, Y, and Z. No, the only thing you and I deserve tonight is hell. But because of the cross of Calvary, we get the opportunity to go to heaven. Yeah, that's right. Amen. We need to be careful with our charge. In my life, personally, God has charged me with the responsibility of a wife and children. If I act haphazardly with that, then why should God bless me in any other area? God's given me the charge of a church there in Tennessee where we live. If I, if I do not 
if I do not abide well in that duty, why should God give me more? I got to be careful with my charge. And if you're going to make a difference tonight, young or old, you're going to have to be careful with what God has given you. Number two, I like this. David was a difference maker, first of all, because he was careful with his charge. But number two, and I'm going to lose a bunch of you on this, and that'll be all right. Maybe you'll pick back up on point number three. Number two, his concerns were not carnal. David's concerns were not carnal. Watch your Bibles. Look at verses 25 through 27 with me. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? David said a mouthful right there. I'm going to touch on just a little bit of it in a moment here. But he identifies his position. And in verse number 27, And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. Now you've got to keep in mind, David has been brought down to this place where he is just to simply see how things are going. And David becomes a key role player. In fact, he becomes the main character yeah. in the story. Yeah. Because yeah. when he gets down there, He's not concerned. I hope you're listening to this tonight. He's not concerned with what everybody else is concerned with. There's a lot of young people, old people alike, that get messed up and get in trouble because they are concerned with what everybody else is concerned with. Amen? You don't need the latest technology just because everybody else has it. Isn't that what young people say? Well, so-and-so has it. So-and-so gets to do it. I'm not so-and-so's dad and you ain't getting it and you ain't doing it. Somebody shout amen tonight. Amen. <laughs> We've got a lot of carnal concerns in our world. And it seems that we are feeding these carnal concerns. David's concerns were not carnal. I want you to look real quickly at what he was offered. First of all, he was offered wealth, was he not? Letter A. He was offered wealth. He said the king will enrich him with great riches. Whoever kills this Philistine is going to be a wealthy, wealthy man. There's a lot of people that will do anything for a dollar, is there not? Yeah, that's right. yeah. That crazy show Fear Factor that was on years ago had people on there laying in beds of snakes just to win five or six hundred dollars in that round. Keep your five or six hundred dollars. I'm not laying in a bed of snakes. Somebody give me a witness. That's right. They ain't never. Somebody said, "What's a good snake?" I said, "A dead one." Amen. <laughs> I don't care what it is. They said, "That's a good snake." I said, "Praise God, there ain't no such thing. Everything about them is evil." Yeah. That's right. uh, Concerns are not carnal. He was offered wealth. The world will do anything for wealth. Constantly seeking a quick way to wealth. Let her be. They, he was offered a wife. The Bible says here that the king said he'll give him his daughter. I've known a lot of people do a lot of things for wealth, but there's a lot of people do a lot of things for a woman. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of wrong things. He was offered wealth. He was offered wife. I like this. Let her see. He was offered his own will. Whoever killed this Philistine giant was offered his own will. The Bible said he'll make his father's house free in Israel. There's three pretty substantial payments for the one who knocks this Philistine down and kills him. David wasn't worried about any of that. That's right. I love his response, don't you? David says this in, in, in verse number 26. Watch this. While he was offered wealth, a wife, and his own will, here's what David said. David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? I'll tell you what David was concerned with. Not carnal things. First of all, David was concerned with Israel's sin, wasn't he? There's a reason we're in this predicament. It's because of the reproach of Israel, the sin of Israel. We're embattled with things that we shouldn't be embattled with. We've got an enemy that's facing us that's a real enemy. 
And I'm concerned not with wealth, not with a wife, not with my own will. But first of all, let's start with Israel's sin. Who's going to be done? What's going to happen to the one that takes the reproach away from Israel? Not only was he concerned with Israel's sin, I believe he was concerned with Israel's salvation, don't you? Watch this next phrase. I don't have time to preach a whole Old Testament survey tonight, but he says this, For who is this, watch this now, uncircumcised Philistine. In the Old Testament, those that were saved and unsaved were separated by circumcision and uncircumcision. And David very boldly and very plainly states his position. He says, who does this uncircumcised Philistine think that he is? David asked a question that a lot of us ought to be asking. Who is this wicked world and who do they think they are today? But there's no line of division when it comes to the saved and the lost hardly today. There's so much of the world in the church rather than the church reaching the world. We've adapted the world's methods, the world's music, the world's message, and all we're left with is the world's mess tonight. You hear me loud and clear. There ought to be a dividing line between the world and the church. David was not concerned with carnal things. He was concerned with Israel's sin, Israel's salvation, and then, let us see, he was concerned with Israel's success. Let me move on tonight. How can you be a difference maker? Do you want to be a difference maker? I do. One of the greatest fears that I have is that I will close my eyes in death. And the ministry that God has allowed me to, to have a part of will not have made any difference. I've shared that with folks a lot of places that I've gone, that's my greatest fear when it comes to the ministry. That what I've done will not make a difference. And, and I'm telling you this this evening, I don't have time to dwell on this, but you pray for your man of God tonight. Pastors and preachers all around this nation are, are dealing with discouragement, thinking that what God has called us into isn't making a difference. But I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference not for my name, but for the name of Jesus Christ. How are you going to do that? You're going to have to be careful with your charge. Your concerns can't be carnal. Number three, David saw the cause amidst the conflict. David saw the cause amidst the conflict. Look at verses 28 and 29. As, as I read this text, it's amazing to me. David fights several little battles before he gets to the big battle, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah, he does. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he engages people en route to the Valley of Elah. That he has to get some things settled with before he ever gets to the big battle. And here's one of them tonight. And it comes by way, get a hold of this, of his big brother. <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah. If anybody ought to be standing in your corner, shouldn't it be your big brother? Amen. Not so with David. Watch verse 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard... When he spake unto the man, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And I want you to notice this. Eliab, in this interaction with David, he attacks three areas of David's life. Letter A, he attacks David's intention, doesn't he? Why it is that David's come down? That's what he asked him. He says, why art thou come hither? Why are you here? Why camest thou down hither? What is your purpose? What is your intention? He does not understand what David's uh, purpose was when he came down there, but he feels the need now to attack David's intention. Let her be. He attacks David's importance. Watch this now. Young people, listen to this. He said, Why camest thou down hither? Verse number 28. And with whom... Hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Do you know what Eliab was saying to David? I'll tell you exactly what he was saying. He didn't come right out and say it, but here's what he was saying. We're the ones here to fight the battle. We're the important ones. Success in this battle is hinged on us. And by the way, David, could you leave those few sheep with in the wilderness? In other words, David, you're not important enough to be here. 
Can I help you with something, church? Don't ever be guilty of making these young people feel like they're not important. Some people, some people say this, they're the church of tomorrow. You're dead wrong. They're the church of today. Yeah. Yeah. And what they learn right here in this place today, right now, will determine how they serve God in the years to come. But Eliab looks at David with great disdain and says, you're not important. Your job is to keep those few sheep there and let us tend to the battle. Little did he know. David was going to do something that he didn't even have the guts to begin. Right. Yeah, there you go. He didn't even have the guts to go forward with. He attacks David's. Listen, to this he attacks David's intention. Why are you here? David's importance. Who'd you leave those few sheep with? Let us see. He attacks David's integrity. Here's what he says. He looks at David in his eyeball. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. The only reason you came down is to see the battle. Yeah. Boy, it's a good thing I wasn't David. Because <laughs> I'd have looked alive in his eyes when he gets at them fighting words me and I said, yeah, I'd have said, yeah, I'm going to see it real good when I take that Philistine down. <laughs> I get a front row view of the battle, but that's not what David did. Right. As his older brother is there attacking his integrity, Tells him that he's got a pride problem, that his heart is not right. All David does is say what is one of the most infamous phrases That's right. That's right. in all of the Old Testament. He says, What have I now? What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? David's reminder to him was not one of backlash. It was not one that was that was aimed and geared towards getting back at his brother. It was one that was there to remind him that there was a cause that was bigger than the both of them. That's right. Amen. And I'm going to tell you tonight, child of God, we've got a cause that we're involved in that's bigger than all of us tonight. That's why we don't have time for the back and forth. We don't have time for all the nonsense. There is a cause. It's the cause of Christ. Folks are dying and going to hell. What are we doing to involve ourselves in the kingdom work of Christ? What are we doing to make a difference? If you're going to make a difference, you're going to have to be careful with your charge. Your concerns can't be carnal. You have to see the cause amidst the conflict very quickly. You're going to have to put your confidence in your Creator, verses 32 through 37. I don't have time to spend a great deal of time right here, but I'll give you just a thought or two, and we'll close out the message. Confidence in your Creator. Look at verse number 32. I'll, I'll go ahead and give you the sub points, and then I'll, I'll look at it. You can have confidence tonight because of past victories, right? If you ever wonder if God's going to be faithful in the present, just look at what He's brought you through in the past. Amen. That's what David does. Verse number 34, David said unto Saul, Watch as thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. He talks about past victories that lead to, let her be, present victories. David said a, a Goliath isn't going to be a challenge. There was a lion and there was a bear, and God gave me victory then, and God will give me victory right now. That's right. Can mm -hmm. I tell you, child of God, you can have confidence in your Creator. There's a whole lot of people I've known in my life, I don't put confidence in them. But I put confidence in Creator God this evening. Right. Let me close with this. <clears throat> How are you going to be a difference maker? Young and old alike, you're going to have to be careful with your charge. Number two, your concerns cannot be carnal. Number three, calls. You're going to have to see the calls amidst the conflict. Number four, have confidence in your Creator. But finally tonight, and here's where the rubber meets the road, you're going to have to continue until you conquer. You're going to have to continue until you conquer. Now as Paul Harvey would say, you know the rest of the story. David leaves out from the presence of his brother after having declared that there is a cause. He goes in to plead his case to Saul. Saul tells him, you're nothing but a youth. You're just young. 
What difference can you make? You're just young. That's the same thing a lot of people say today in churches. What difference can a young person make? But David leaves out from there. And he goes to the battle. But before he does, I, I want to say three things about the kind of weapon you need to conquer tonight, alright? To be a conqueror. Letter A, you need a proven weapon. Every one of these speaks of the Word of God tonight, just in case you don't understand that. First of all, you need a proven weapon. Watch your Bible. Look at verse 38 and 39. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not what? Proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. What happened? Here's what happened, young people. Saul said, Alright, it's your funeral, but at least try to take this armor with you. And then in one of the most cowardly events of the story here, set aside the fact that the Israelite army ran away with their tail tucked between their legs. Every time Goliath made an appearance, ran his mouth about the armies of the living God and God Himself. Now Saul says, I'm not going to go face him, but if you want to take my armor, look at me. An armor that Saul should have put on and went and faced him. He said, David, you can take my armor. David has it on him. He takes that sword. And there's an indicator here that even the armor of Saul that he is too cowardly to put on himself and go face Goliath with weighs more than David does. It's, it's at least weighing him down. He says, I can't go. I have not proved these things. I, I'm saying this to you tonight. We need a proven weapon tonight. David goes from there. He goes down there to the brook. To this day, there's still a brook that goes down through the valley of Elah. It's all dried up. There's no water. It's just a stony area that looks like the remnants of where a brook used to be. But David goes down to that brook and he picks out five smooth stones. And you sit here and you think, what's a stone among, uh, when it goes to coming up against the giant? Letter B, not only do we need a proven weapon, but we need a powerful weapon. Don't we? Amen. We need a powerful weapon. Verses 45 through 47. Watch it real quick. I'm almost done. David said, David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of, the, of hosts, the God of the armies of, the, of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the... I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Amen. It never was about the five stones. It was about the power of God that David approached Goliath. And you'll never win victories in your life, young people, old people alike. You'll never win victories in your life without the power of God. I'm going to say this and I'll be done. We need a proven weapon. We need a powerful weapon. But we need a provided weapon. Let me say this before I move on to this last part. We've got a proven weapon. We've got a powerful weapon. We've got a provided weapon. All Scripture is given by God. He provided it to us. But I like this. Look at verses 50 and 51. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head. 50, look at verse 50. This is what I wanted you to see. So David prevailed against the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. Listen, but there was no sword in the hand of David. So David goes to where the Philistine is down. By the way, I like this analogy right here. David slung that stone, sunk it right into Goliath's forehead, and Goliath didn't fall backwards, but he fell forward. You ever notice that? I mean, a nurse's science tells you tonight that a, that a stone coming this way hits you ought to make you fall backwards. 
I like what one preacher said, it was the mighty hand of God that smacked Goliath. <laughs> he fell forward. Killed him. Goliath now advances to where, or David advances to where Goliath is laying there on the ground. And he does not have a sword in his hand. Right. You say, what's David going to do? He's going to make sure the task is completely that's done. Right, that's right. right. Yeah. He's going to make sure that, that Goliath doesn't have concussion. <laughs> That he's not just knocked out. He's going to make sure that Goliath never gets back up. He's going to make sure, Uncle Gary, that that man who defied God Himself never has an opportunity to do it again. Amen. He doesn't have a sword in his hand. But God provided him a sword, didn't He? Goliath's own sword. Yep. I don't have time to get you to turn here. But just a couple more chapters over, this is not the only time that God provided this same sword. That's right, that's right, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Just a couple chapters over, he goes to the priest of Himalek, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. And, and he's on the run for his life. You look at it, I think it's chapter 21, 22, somewhere along in there. He's on the run for his life from Saul. He goes to the priest there and he says, you got any bread? And the priest says, there's no bread here except the hallowed bread or the holy bread. And he says, go ahead and take part of that. And so David gets some nourishment. He gets that bread. David begins to think, not only do I need some bread, boy, Saul is hot on my trails. I need a sword somewhere. I love this, don't you? David said, is there a sword anywhere here? And Ahimelech says, oh yeah, we got one in the back. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you real familiar with that sword, David. <laughs> You've used it. It's the sword of Goliath. The sword you used to end his life. It's back there hidden behind the ephod. Get it if you want it. And I love what David says. David says, oh, I might have had that for a for <laughs> David said, he said, there's no sword like that sword. Mm -hmm. Give it me. When David needed a sword to chop Goliath's head off, God provided a sword. Years later, when David's running for his life, God provides that sword again through the priest to him. David now has that sword back in time. I'm glad tonight God's provided us a sword. Aren't you glad for the Word of God this evening? Amen. Amen. You'll never be the Christian that God wants you to be. You'll never be a difference maker as long as you don't make much of God's Word. Be a difference maker. Let's stand to our feet. If the sister might come and play a verse or two of invitation this evening. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed this evening. We won't have an invitation hymn of swords this evening per se. But I want to give you the opportunity to come tonight. God has spoken in your heart. You don't have to be a young person to come to the altar tonight. Maybe you'd be here and you'd say, God, help me to be a difference maker for the generation that's coming behind me. I, I tell you what I'd like to do tonight. I'd like everybody 18 years of age and younger to come up to the front tonight. If you're 18 years of age and younger tonight, come right here. Just come kind of stand in this area tonight. Come on, come on. 18 years of age and younger. Come on. Come on. Just kind of come stand in this area. If you want to kneel and pray, you go ahead and kneel and pray. Stand right here in this area. Here's the question I've got for Grace Bible Baptist Church. Look up here at these young people for a moment tonight. Are they not worth you being a difference maker for? Them? The world's cast them aside. I wonder tonight if you might be willing just to come and pray for their sakes. Come find a place in this altar tonight. They're worth it this evening. They are worth it. The generation coming behind you is worth it tonight. They're worth your investment. I wonder if she plays tonight. Young people, if you want to stand or you stand there. If you want to pray tonight, you kneel and pray. But Grace Bible Baptist Church, those that are in the pews, these young people worth praying for tonight? Come on. Leave out of your seat tonight. You come and pray tonight. I'm just trying to mind the Lord. All I'm trying to do, God, help me to be a difference maker for their sake.
for the glory and the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help me to be faithful to make a difference in one of their lives. You come this evening. Find the Lord. Be obedient to God tonight. It's somebody's child. It's somebody's grandchild. Somebody's niece. Somebody's nephew. A young person, if there's a prayer you can pray tonight, is God help me to be faithful to you. Help me to make a difference for you tonight. might be here tonight you may not know what it is to be a child of God. There's somebody here to be glad to take a Bible and show you how you can know. Whatever your age, maybe you're here tonight and say, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. I don't know for sure that I'm a child of God. If you'd like for someone to show you how you can know that, don't leave here tonight without having done that. God will save you tonight. He'll save you just where you are, just like you are. All you got to do is come to Him. that tonight it's not too late don't leave from here don't don't leave from here not knowing where your eternity is going to be jesus said this that if you'll come to him he will in no wise cast you he's ready willing and able to save those that will come to him Amen. he loves you this evening you got anything else tonight God bless you. Thank you for being here this week. All hearts and minds clear this evening. Thank you to the church. Thank you for the hospitality. Thank you for the place to stay. All the meals. I said last night, more food than we can eat. Nine minutes, and we're so thankful for that tonight. Thank you. It's not that way everywhere you go, but y'all went above and beyond to take care of us, and we're so grateful for that tonight. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts to the whole church. Thank you so much. All right? God bless you. Let's be this.